the narrative of Abram from focusing on the promises of land to focusing on the promised seed. Up until this point, the story has been focused on the promised land. But now, especially after chapter 15, the focus will be on the promised seed or the heir of Abram in this narrative. The promises that Abram was able to stand on in the 15th chapter are the promises that of all of us on our journey of faith can also stand on. We used to sing a song called Standing on the Promises of God. That's what the book of Genesis is all about. And I want to set the stage as we move through Genesis chapter 15. Let's begin with looking at verses number 1 through 3. The promises of God banish fear. The promises of God banish fear. During this section of the narrative, we have Abram standing face to face with God and and he seeks to refute the promise and, and resist the assurance that God has given him. Clearly, the faith to which Abram is called is not peaceful. Uh-huh. It's not a pious acceptance on his part. We look at Abram's faith as being one that is hard fought, one that is deeply argued with conviction. In other words, Abram is not going to be a passive recipient of the promise. And, and Abram is really prepared to hold, hold his own as he goes to face with God concerning the promise. Uh-huh. Let's look at verse number one. The Bible says that after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Often times in our lives is after these things, when fear and doubt enter our lives, that we begin to, to question the providence of God. Uh So what are the things that Moses is referring to here? Catalaim, the king of Elam, and we gotta go back to Genesis chapter 14, had united his forces and those of three other kings in a league of conquest. They were the superpowers of their day in Genesis chapter 14. The Rephaim, Zuzum, Enon, Horites, Amalekites, Amerikites. Each of these were defeated by um, Catalaramir and his forces. They even were powerful enough to throw over the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and they took Abram's nephew Lot prisoner. Now Abram, when he heard this, went forth as the head of his household armed with 318 armed servants. Uh He went against the superpower of his day in a surprise attack at night, overcame Catalemar. In fact, he was slain. He rescued Lot and defeated this mighty army with 318 servants. Lot was delivered. He was, he met Melchizedek, the king of Salem, the priest and king of the most high God. And and Abram gave him a tenth of his blessings and Melchizedek blessed him. So now Abram is on a spiritual high. Mm -hmm. But during that time in defeating Kenelamah and his allies, Abram made some bitter enemies. And it is likely that these enemies would not arrest until they took vengeance on Abram and his 318 servants. Uh So now Abram, after coming off of a spiritual high and defeating these kings, it was after these things Uh that Abram was alarmed. Abram was fearful. He was apprehensive. Now, Now Abram was disoriented. He was so fearful about his future. Uh It was after those things. And the narrative 
Moses seeks to put in and rewrite the story for Abram. Because remember that Abram's state of mind is he's disoriented. Mm -hmm. He's fearful. But Moses interrupts this time in Abram's life with a do not be afraid. Uh -huh. Now wait a minute. I just defeated Kedalaomar and his enemies and, and his allies. And now they're seeking my life. And upon that, there's not a change in, in Sarah's condition. Uh -huh. I'm an old man, and, and Sarah is past childbearing. Sarah's call to barrenness is just a false alarm. Uh -huh. If their barrenness prevails, then the promise that you made me, God, is null and void. Abraham has everything to fear, but God is not going to leave it there. And God speaks a word, and he says, do not be afraid. Amen. Now, it was more than just a word of greeting. Right. The power of that message, that word, was earth-shattering. Fear not. Don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. it, it shocks Abraham, who was fearful about his future. Right. Fear not is a word that shattered, shattered the notion of after those things in Abram's situation. Mm -hmm. Fear not. Don't be afraid begins to change Abram's perspective about things. Right. Fear not. Do not be afraid reestablishes the promise that God made in Genesis chapter 12. Yes. When yes. God tells you fear not, uh -huh. when he tells Abram fear not, right. is the first step in the reaffirmation of Abram's wavering faith at the time. Uh -huh. Why did he tell him not to fear? He said, because I am your shield. Amen. Your reward will be very great. And so now what the Lord does, he identifies himself in terms of the relationship yes, yes. that he has with Abram. Uh -huh. And this is why Abram can <coughs> take courage after those things in his life. Uh -huh. He says that I am your shield. Uh -huh. I'm your deliverer. Yes. In this verse, the Lord is confirming his blessings on Abram. By promising that you're going to have some supernatural protection. Amen. Just as a warrior would carry around his shield for protection. Yes. In the same manner, the Lord promises Abram that he's going to deliver him from his enemies. Yes. That he's going to be his protection in the midst of this hostile territory. Uh -huh. Verse number two, but Abraham answers with a question. He says, oh Lord, God, what will you give me? For I continue to be childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Abram simply says, can the closed womb of Sarah be broken open to give birth to a new future in my life? And here's Abram's struggle with faith. See, Abram didn't respond with a passive acceptance of the vision, but he, he begins with the question, and you know what? That's all right. You know, God is such a loving, tender, gentle, understanding, yes. patient God Amen. when we have our crisis of faith. Yes. His question that Abram presented before God really speaks of the anguish of heart and, and a desire from some certainty in his life. Uh -huh. You can hear the pain in Abram's question. Just paraphrasing, a, a slave born in my house is going to be heir now because Sarah is past childbearing. And, and these words reveal the anguish of the of soul that Abram had. And it, and it brings to light the human dimension of Abram's struggle with his crisis of faith. Abram feared that in some way the promise that all the families of the earth would be blessed would 
did not necessarily mean that he would be the father of the child. Right. He's confronted with the thought that perhaps the Lord is going to fulfill the promise through a, the perfectly acceptable practice of regarding a servant as the heir of a childless man. Uh -huh. This is not what Abram had in mind. And he said so to God in no uncertain terms. Amen. One of the things that we see from these two verses is that after spiritual success in our life, it seems as if doubt and fear are always lurking around the corner. What do you mean, preacher? Well, when we look at the life of Joseph, he was favored by his father. He was given the coat of many colors. He received a, a dream or a revelation from God that one day his brothers, his sisters, his mother's father would bow down before him, but he had another soon after these things. Uh -huh. Come on now. Where his brothers sold him into slavery, where he was cast into prison. It seems after you've been on a spiritual high, you'll have an after these things situation in your life. Moses, the promised deliverer, he led the people out of Egypt by God's mighty hand. After the manifestation of God's power through the ten plagues, overcoming Pharaoh, parting of the Red Sea, it was after these things that the people complained and wanted to go back to Egypt. Amen. And we even wanted to stone Moses. Jacob, the, the Job, the richest man in the east, seven sons, three daughters, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 cattle, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkey, donkeys, and many uh, servants. However, when the sons of God presented themselves before the Lord, Satan came also among them. Amen. And soon after, Job had an after these things moment. He lost his children, he lost his wealth, and finally he lost his health. Christ, during his passion, they brought him a donkey and a coat and put the on their cloaks and, and sat on them and most of the crowd even spread their cloaks on the road. Other cut branches, trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went out before him followed him shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the highest. But after these things, Judas betrayed him. His disciples fled from him. But crowd shouted, crucify him. Everybody has an after these things moment in your life. Everybody's going to have a crisis of faith. Amen. It seems as if every time that I have a mountaintop experience, I experience an after these things valley. When I'm successful in my struggle against Satan and his minions, I have an after these things experience. When I struggle with my besetting sin, there's an after these things situation uh -huh. in my life. All right. After these things yeah. has encompassed many sleepless nights in my life. Uh -huh. After these things, I've cried many tears. Come on, come on. After these things, I've prayed that the Lord will return. Amen. I'm healthy. I'm not taking any meds. Never been in a hospital. But after these things, When you have your after these things moment, then that's when you experience your crisis of faith. What can we do when we have these after these things experiences and these moments? What can I do when there is a crisis of faith moment? First of all, you can't do anything. Let me just put that on, on the table right now. The problem is you try to do something. God says what you need to do is do not be afraid. When you try to fix your after these things times in your life, you operate outside of God's will. God didn't tell you to come up with your solutions to your crisis of faith. What Christ, what he said to us was do not be afraid. And when I came to realize that, his words sent shockwaves through my soul. Do not be afraid, Dwayne. His words 
just reverberate in my spirit. Do not be afraid brings order to chaos in my life. I just lost my job and there's more month than money. Uh, don't be afraid. My spouse is dying. How am I going to make it? I can't go on. Don't be afraid. I've overcome this besetting sin, but it's always there. Don't be afraid. I'm worried about my children, Father. Don't be afraid. I can't. Uh, uh, I, I'm scared to share the gospel because I might be canceled or, or persecuted. Don't be afraid. That's what you need to do when you have your crisis of faith. Don't be afraid. Why? Because fear, it warps our perception of reality. And it turns your successes that God has given you into failures. You can't see them anymore. Dwayne, don't be afraid. Because the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. God tells us, don't be afraid when you have your crisis of faith. Because God is your shield and your reward is going to be very great. God protects his children. Now, I'm not going to tell you that God is going to change your circumstances. So often we get it twisted because we feel that God's going to change your circumstances. Obviously, God can if he chooses to because he is sovereign. However, God is more concerned about your faith than he is about your circumstances. He's more concerned about your future than your present situation. He's more interested in your faith than your good fortune. God just tells you, don't be afraid. The promises of God promote faith. The promises of God promote faith in yes. verses number 4 through 6. Amen. And the Bible says, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. For your, your very own son shall be your heir. You know, I, God is so patient with us. Yes. You know, we are so descriptive. Yes. The, the analogy of being sheep was just so descriptive of us. But God is so patient because God could have rebuked him and said, look, now I gave you this promise back in Genesis chapter 12. You got one more time to doubt what I'm saying. But God is not like that. He didn't rebuke Abram. But he used that as an opportunity to reaffirm his covenant that he made with Abram. This gracious reaffirmation allowed Abram to speak boldly to the Lord and to reveal what's going on on the inside. And he, and he made no secret of his, the wound of his spirit. See, yeah. when you have a personal relationship with God, you, you should be able to tell him everything that's going on in your life. Amen. You know, so often we try to mask our, our conversations with God when we say forgive us of our sins, uh, like God doesn't know. Right, right. Until you identify specifically and you hear it ringing in your ears exactly what that sin is, then you will, that will be the first step of identifying and allowing the Holy Spirit to help you to overcome that sin. But Abraham wasn't like that. David wasn't like that. They spoke boldly in their conversation with God. And in return for their boldness, they received an instant healing. God's response to Abraham's tumult was an expression of mercy. God, mindful of his suffering, what God did, he took this as an opportunity to rearticulate the promise to him. The Lord begins by telling Abraham, in effect, to, to wait on the birth of his own child, in verse number four. A lot. That's the substance of faith, is waiting on God to make good on his promises. And, and furthermore, on top of that, some of us are visual. Amen? We got to see it and hear it. But in Abram, God took him outside. And what did God do? He wanted to give Abram a visual image. And so he brought him outside in verse number five. 
and said, look toward the heaven. Number the stars if you are able to, to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. What's the point? It's not feasible that a person can look up in the stars and look up into God's universe and, and count the stars. Yet God can number them and he can name them. And that same God that can make stars and beyond number can also make a son for your barren family. And in like manner, we can take refuge in them and we will that we can trust that God is going to bring about the, his promise according to his divinely ordained timing. Uh -huh. God has a perfect track record yes, for doing what he says at do times Amen. in our lives. Uh -huh. The result of, of God's showing Abram the heavens and his word was not only that Abram believed, but in verse number six, he believed in the Lord. And he counted to him for righteousness. Amen. Let's look at this verse for a minute because why is Abram's belief in God counted for righteousness? Was it Abram a believer before that time? Compl contemplated here in Genesis chapter 15 and verse number 6? The Hebrew writer even goes on to declare that by faith in, in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 8 that he left Ur of the Chaldeans. And went out not knowing whither he went. Yet we are not told there that he believed in God and it was counted to him for righteousness. So it's obvious that Abram was a believer when he left Chaldea. But his faith was not there mentioned in connection with his justification. And to find the answer to why the Holy Spirit said that it was accounted to him for righteousness, we need to look at the epistles of Paul in Romans and Galatians. In both of these books, the Holy Spirit singles out the occasion when Abraham's faith was connected with righteousness. And it shows us that this happened in Genesis chapter 15. In the third chapter of the book of Galatians, we see three indications of exactly what Abraham believed here in the 15th chapter of the book of Genesis. First, Abraham believed in the gospel. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 8, the Bible says that the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles, Gentiles by faith did what? Preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying that in you all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So Paul points back to God's promise in Genesis chapter 12 and declares that Abraham understood the statement that all the nations of the earth shall be blessed with you through you as more than a physical blessing, but rather the salvation. Come on. Secondly, when we look at Galatians 3, 13 and 14, we see that Abraham believed in redemption. The Bible says that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. So that they may receive the promised spirit through faith. According to these verses, Paul declares that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. And this was done in Christ Jesus, who Paul says is the blessing of Abraham. Third, we see that Abraham believed in Christ. In Galatians 3 and verse number 16, Paul points to this truth. He says, now the promise was made to Abram and to his offspring. Uh -huh. It does not say to and two offsprings, yeah. referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring, who is Christ. Yeah. Now the promise that was spoken to Abraham and his seed does not say and to seed. The literal translation of seed is not the plural, but the singular. Right. And Paul informs us that Abraham understood that the promise was more than just a promise of many descendants, but the promise of one descendant, uh -huh. the one that would bring justification from sin to the world, yes. and that one descendant was Jesus Christ. Yes. Yes. Amen. The faith which was counted as righteousness. Yes. In Genesis 15, verse 6, was the faith 
that Abram had who, that believed that God um, said about the promised seed. Amen. It was after this instance of faith in which the Holy Spirit selected as a model for believing justification. There is no justification apart from Christ. Amen. And that's what Abram believed. He believed that justification would come through his loins, the promised seed, which is the Christ. And that's why the Holy Spirit says it was accounted to him for righteousness. Yes, amen. Paul would say in Acts chapter 13, 38 through 39, that through this man, Jesus is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, all that believe are justified in all things. Uh -huh. Therefore, it's not that Abram believed God for the first time, but that here, God was openly uh, attest to his righteousness for the first time. Because he believed the world would be saved through his seed, which is Christ. Amen. Thirdly, the promises of, of God unveil the future. Right. The promises of God unveil the future. Amen. The covenant that was made here was a covenant that was made concerning a particular land that the Lord promised Abraham and his descendants. But it was also a covenant that would guarantee the Lord's fulfillment of both the promised land and the seed. Therefore, the Lord says to Abram in verse number seven, that I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you the land to possess it. So the Lord here reaffirms that promise of land to Abram. Abram. And Abram responds, how may I know that I will possess it? And so to confirm that, Jehovah gave Abram a sign or a seal. And, and what God did was he entered into a covenant with Abram. Amen. So what's the purpose of covenants? And this was a practice that was prevalent during the ancient Near East. Uh -huh. And they were made between parties for the purpose of defining the nature of the relationship that was being ent entered into. And the covenant defined the responsibilities and the obligations of both parties entering that covenant together. So in verse number 9 and 10, God directs Abram to bring a heifer, a she-goat, a ram, each three years old, also a turtle dove, and a young pigeon, each being three years old. And these sacrifices were divided. The pieces were laid against one another. And the covenant, covenanting parties passed between them to show that there was no longer a division. What had been divided was considered as one between them. Walking between these divided parts uh, would a view to dramatically indicate that they themselves would be torn like these animals if they reneged on their agreement. That was the practice of cutting a covenant. But in verse number 11 through 16, the covenant that God makes with Abram is one-sided. Abram and the Lord are not going to pass through this together. All day long, oh, he set up his altar and he sat there driving the birds of prey from the sacrifice. And as the sun went down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And a dreadful and great darkness fell upon him in verse number 12. Uh -huh. God also prophesizes that Abram's children are going to suffer 400 years of affliction in Egypt. Right. Afterward, God's going to bring judgment on that nation that they serve. And they, Israel shall come out with great possessions. And there was a foreshadow of this in Genesis chapter 12 when uh, Pharaoh took Sarah into his harem uh -huh. and God brought plagues on Egypt and he gave Sarah back to Abram and they left with great possessions. Uh -huh. That was a foreshadow of what happened to Abram's descendants while they were in Egypt. Yes. In verse number 17, God ratifies this covenant. 
It was customary for both parties to pass through. But notice that Abram didn't pass through these cut up animals. The Lord passed through these pieces that Abram had cut. The reason Abram didn't be because God obligated himself to the fulfillment of his promise. Uh -huh. This covenant was a one-sided guarantee that God was going to fulfill the covenant that he made with Abram and it was not dependent on Abram, but it was dependent upon God himself. Amen. God was putting himself under obligation to mortal man to realize the promises. Right. And so the passing of the fiery pot through the several pieces, this was to ensure the Lord's presence while Israel was in Egypt and to ensure the preservation of his prosperity. Y'all will get it. Let me show you how this covenant went. Let me come here for a minute. So, Demetri and I want to enter into a covenant. And covenant is cutting the covenant on the, on the camera. On the screen. Just come over here because we're going to cut a covenant. So, we go, we cut the, the heifer the she-goat, the ram, the turtle dove, and the pigeon. So in ancient times, what we're going to do, Demetrius, is we're going to walk there on this side, okay? That's what the sacrifice is. We're going to walk together. Come on. We walk it together through this covenant. And I'm, we're going to get to the other side. And Demetrius, I want you to turn around. You see that cut in the covenant up there? If you don't have my back, if someone tries to jump on me, that's what's going to happen to you. If I don't have your back and somebody tries to jump on me, then that's what's going to happen to me. That's how they did it in ancient Israel. Now watch what God did, does with Abram. Come on, Abram. You Abram now. What God said was, you stay there. I'm going to walk through in a smoking pot and a fiery torch. I'm going to obligate myself to you. This covenant doesn't have anything to do with you. I am obligating myself to the fulfillment of my promises. So this is a covenant of grace for you. And that's what God did when he cut the covenant. He placed himself under obligation to fulfill the promise. So why do we have to be afraid? Appreciate you, brother. God placed himself under obligation. The covenant is based upon the sure character of God and has nothing to do with Abraham. All he wanted Abraham to do was to trust. All he wants us to do is trust and don't be afraid. You see, God has this covenant that God has, not only with, it's with Abraham, but it's with us also. Amen. It's an eternal covenant. Listen to what Paul says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 20. Now may the God of peace, who brought you from the dead, from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant. Uh -huh. We are covenant people. And God will finish what he has started within each and every one of us. God's promise is sure. Because God's promise is, is not based on what we do. It's based on God. What promises are you standing on? The only sure promise that you can stand on is God's supernatural saving promises. The only way that we can stand on God's promises, we've got to totally trust him. Right about it. See, I want to be like Abraham. Yeah. I want to be called a friend of God. Yeah. When we are a friend, I want to have that type of relationship that when God tells me, don't be afraid, that I can go to sleep at night. Yeah. You know, and, and I, see, I had one of these 
crisis of faith. Last week, I mean, I, will, I could not sleep. I was worried so bad. And then finally, after, let's see, maybe an hour or two of just worrying myself over the situation, I finally came to my senses and, and put my trust in God. And he says, don't be afraid. And I was able to be at peace and go to sleep. My wife didn't even know it. But that's the promise that God has given with us. Is life going to be easy? No. Every step that you take in your faith is going to be hard fault. It's going to be a hard fought faith. And you're going to have your peaks and your valleys, just as Abram did. Abram had his successes, he had his failures. In fact, when you read his life, it was constantly like this. And, and as we move through this life today, we're going to have those crises of faith. But how do we manage that? First, understand, there's going to be an after these things. Just when you get off of your spiritual mountaintop, there's an after these things valley that's just right around the corner. Secondly, don't be afraid. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. Don't be afraid. And, and, and when these words from God, when they fill your soul, when they reverberate through your spirit, it, you, you're able to bring chaos into order. You're able to take those prayers to God yes. all out of all this mass confusion of what's yes. going into your life and focus in on the real things in life that matter. Yes. And it brings order to your life. Yes. And then rely on the future. Yes. God is, there is a future plan. It's, this isn't it right. for us. Amen. We have a future waiting for us. And God has given us an opportunity to look behind the curtain to see what he has planned for us. That's how you handle your crisis of faith. If you are not a member of the body of Christ, you're not going to make it in this world. If you don't know Jesus as I know him, as we know him, your life is going to be one of mass confusion. Jesus came to this world to save sinners such as us. He loved us so much that he, he counted his glory as something not to be grasped, but he divested himself of his heavenly glory. And he came in the form of a slave, of a servant. He took on humanity, lived as a man, died as a man. He is a high priest that is, cannot, he, can be, he knows what we're going through, our affirmities and his our weaknesses. And he was that perfect sacrifice mm -hmm. that died for your sins, for my sins. Mm -hmm. The Bible paints a bleak, a bleak picture about sin. All that have sinned must die. Mm -hmm. Every one of us have fallen short of his glory. Mm -hmm. But God loved us so much that he sent his son to die in our place. All he, you need to do is just believe. Just trust that he is. And then you must repent of your sins. Repent means to think differently. It is a change of mind followed by a corresponding change of action. That's what repentance is. I no longer want to live for the world. I want to live for him. Amen. Come on now. Then we must confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then lastly, we must be baptized. We have to be buried in that watery grave so that our sins are washed away. Don't be concerned about what is in the water. Just be baptized. And then you begin that process of sanctification, of living for Him. And you... You're going to have those times in your life when you're going to struggle, when you're going to wrestle with your faith. And don't think that something is wrong with you when you have that struggle. 
Because every last child of God has that crisis of faith. Yes, sir. What separates the winners is that they know how to handle it. Amen. If there's anyone who is going through a crisis of faith right now, desire the prayers of the righteous. Don't be afraid. What do you got to be afraid for? You know, I, my dad was the biggest, baddest man in the whole world. I had no fear when I was with the gunny. Never. Well, I'm with the creator of the, I'm a child of the creator of the, of the universe. The king of the universe. What do I have to fear? Keep fighting. Keep fighting. Is anyone here subject to the invitation? Please come forward as we sing our invitation song.